morning, everyone. My name's Raven, and I'm the Serving Teams and Communications Coordinator. Many of you are probably in your city groups right now or with family members, and we just wanna say, happy Sunday. This morning, we hope you take the time to chat with your friends and family that can't be physically present with you this morning. And so if you're new, say a quick hello and connect. We would love to meet with you. The gathering is going to start in about 15 minutes. So again, chat with your friends and family and we'll connect with you soon.
Good morning, everyone. My name's Raven, and I'm the Serving Teams and Communications Coordinator. We are so excited to worship with you this morning. Today, we have Ricky from City Light South Lincoln preaching for us over Psalm 22. We value church planting, and this is one of the churches we will be supporting financially and in prayer. This week, be on the lookout for other churches we've supported as we highlight them on our social media. Our gathering will begin in about two minutes, so be sure and grab your communion supplies and we'll worship with you soon. Good morning, Providence Church. Um, if you would, uh, maybe just like, stand up as we get to sing and worship our God. Our God is the God of the cosmos, and he has invited us to worship him today. So let's come and worship.
thanksgiving we come and we will bow down with creation we cry out oh, in daylight in darkness we sing to the Lord and we will bow down our rock of salvation Morning by morning, with thanksgiving we come, and we will bow down, the creation we cry out, in daylight and darkness, we sing to you. church thank you for worshiping with us this morning um you know as the the people of god it is our privilege that we get to come before god and confess our sins to him i don't know if you ever thought about it like that 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 for the people of god when we get to confess our sins that's actually a unique privilege that we have uh, think about it when for many of us when we are confronted with sin when we're told that we've done something wrong when we've seen that we've hurt people or feel a conviction for most of us our our knee-jerk reaction is to defend ourselves to justify ourselves to 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 basically plead our innocence before people will say things like hey it's just the you, you took the tone the wrong way or I didn't really mean it like that or if you just knew my circumstances it, it really wasn't that bad we spend so much of our life trying to, to plead with people that we are more innocent than we may truly be. But for the people of God, we have the privilege of, of just coming before God and confessing our sins, admitting that we are guilty, admitting that we've hurt people and that we have not worshiped God as we should. And so uh, we as a people want to routinely be confessing our sins, but every so often we just want to do that on a Sunday morning, that we would just plead with God for his mercy, that we are sinners, that we have sinned, that we have not worshiped him, that we have not loved others as ourselves. And so this morning, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. Um, the words are going to be on the screen, and I would just ask you, would you just uh, read these along with me as we pray this together? So let's pray together. Father, we confess that we are a sinful people before a great God. We confess the many times we have sinned against you and hurt those around us. We confess that often we want to cover up and defend our sins. We confess our pride has caused more sin. Father, we ask for your mercy on us. We ask that you would not hold our rebellion and hurtful actions against us. We ask that you help us to recognize and own up to our sin. And we ask that you would kill our pride and create in us a humble heart. Father, we admit our guilt and ask for your grace. Amen. And you know, the goodness for the people of God in confessing our sins isn't just that we get to say these things. It's not just religious cliches, but we get to plead for God's mercy and we get to be assured that he has work to give you forgiveness. This morning, if you're confessing that from your heart's posture that you want to lay your sins before God, I want to remind you of the truth of the gospel from 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It says, for our sake, he made him, that is Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. If you have confessed your sins and you trust in Jesus for your forgiveness so you can be free, so you can be free to confess your sins at any point, to freely admit that you are not perfect, his grace has covered you. So would we now continue to sing because the blood of Jesus covers us and his forgiveness is for us. Oh 
to the fold of God. Christ that brought me to the fold of God. He died for me. Father, today we stand in your grace. Thank you so much for what you've done for us. Jesus, um, thank you for your spirit that has sealed our life to you. While we were enemies of you, God, you brought us to a place that is so much greater than we could ever be in the presence of God. And so today we thank you for the gift um, of your presence, the gift of your people, and the gift of your spirit. In your holy name, amen. Hey, Providence Church. Man, it's so good to be with you this morning, worshiping together. And we are together online. I know that we would love to be together in person, worshiping in the same room, uh, but it's still fun to gather and sing songs. Man, Gabe and Jenna, thank you so much for leading us. Um, during a normal service, during this time, uh, we usually do a meet and greet, but uh, we value community, we value connection, and we would love to continue uh, to fight for that in this season, to intentionally pursue one another. So I know that some of you are in city groups right now, gathered in living rooms together. Some of you are families, you're sitting on your living room, 
couch and there might be kids that are crawling over you crying, you're kind of fighting to just pay attention. Whatever the case, uh, we want to pursue one another this morning. And so how we like to do this as we're doing this online gathering is if you're in a city group, stay socially distanced, but uh, take about 90 seconds to say hello to someone next to you, uh, maybe ask them how they're doing. And if you're uh, just with by yourself or with just your roommates or with your family at home, uh, I'll give you permission to grab your phone for a second and just send a few texts to people that are in our church, maybe somebody who God brings to mind for you this morning. Uh, send a few texts, tell, ask them how they're doing, tell them you miss them, tell them you wish you were together, and then after that, uh, feel free uh, to put your phone down for the rest of our time. But I'll give you a few seconds, maybe about 90 seconds, and we'll uh, greet one another now. Welcome back, church family. Hey, we actually have a fun uh, change of pace, uh, kind of something different because we have a couple guests with us. And these are the two lead pastors, my friends from City Light South Lincoln. It's Alex and Ricky. Guys, welcome here. And we actually get the chance to hear um, from Ricky preaching the word. Is it Pastor Rick, Reverend Ricky? I don't know. Maybe it's just Ricky. He's going to preach. Yeah, just preach the word for us in a little bit. Um, but we brought these guys here uh, because we want to highlight church planting this morning. Uh, we love church planting. We believe that it's one of the most effective ways to make disciples in our world. And we're actually a part of a church planting uh, family or network called the City Light family. We ourselves are a church plant almost three years old. And uh, these guys are one of the newest church plants in the City Light family, which I believe over the course of the last eight years have gone from zero churches to, I think we have 14 churches in total now, or we will by the end of the year. So that's pretty fun. Uh, and these guys are here just sharing with us. And one thing I wanted to, to share with you guys by way of encouragement is because of your generosity, Providence Church family, uh, we are able to actually support these guys financially by uh, giving them a check for $5,000 just to see lives change in South Lincoln, to see uh, families impacted, to see neighborhoods reached, to see people um, uh, reached with the gospel. And so we're excited about that. But enough from me. I wanted to give uh, Pastor Alex a second uh, to share with us. Um, do people call you that, Pastor Alex? No, I'll just... Pastor. Okay. No. <laughs> pastor. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, I'd love to uh, just hear, hey, what's one thing that you feel like God is doing or one thing that you're excited about in South Lincoln right now? And then maybe is there a way that we could pray for you guys? Yeah, so uh, one thing that's pretty typical in our local content, uh, local context in South Lincoln is the stereotype of Nebraska nice, right? Mm -hmm. People will say, hey, how's it going? How you doing? And people will be really quick to just say, we're doing great. We're fine. Uh, and the reality is, in our local context, while there may not be a ton of felt needs that you can see up front, there, there's deep just brokenness in the midst of hearts of people, whether it's marriages that are struggling or just internally just some depression, anxiety, uh, struggling with kids, whatever that may be, people will tend to just put on a face and save face in the midst of conversations. And so we desire to see real connections, real relationships, real authenticity and vulnerability in our church family. And we've seen that happen in the two months since we've planted, which has been absolutely wild. In our city group, my city group alone, we're having conversations as we've preached to this 
Psalms as well. And we're talking about Psalm 13. And, and uh, the, the, the psalmist writes, how long, O Lord? Right? And he just cries out to the Lord to, to just say, how long, O Lord? And as we're discussing the text with our city group, people are actually saying, actually, this is happening in life. There, there's some real dark things that just feel hard. There's some sin that's in my life. And people are coming forward and just confessing that to one another so we could pray for each other, encourage one another. And so it's been so cool to see people grow, to just be honest with one another, to say, hey, you, you are my brother and my sister, and, and I can just be honest with you, and you will just encourage me and walk with me to continue to grow. And so that's been a really sweet thing that we've seen happen in the midst of our church and our family to just say, man, we're going to be real together. We're going to link arms and actually be brothers and sisters in the faith. And so mm -hmm. that's been super sweet to see. Uh, in terms of a prayer request and something that we're just continuing to look forward to, it's just our church and our, our, our people continue to dive deep together. Like I said, we want to see real, committed, connected relationships with one another. And we want to see people just grow intimately with Jesus all the more. And so we're just praying, God, would you do more in our church family? Would people just love to just hear from God, to meet with God, to meet with one another to continue to just grow uh, just deep roots with Jesus and with their church family. Yeah, that's cool. Thanks for sharing. I'm encouraged by you guys' faith and what's, what God is doing through you guys. So would you mind if I prayed for you guys right now? Yeah, yeah let me pray for you guys. Um, Jesus, I'm thankful for Alex and Ricky, and for the burden that you've placed on their hearts uh, for this new church, for South Lincoln. God, um, we pray, just as Alex requested, that you would grow people deep in the gospel, that people would see real heart transformation, that people would take off the masks and be real and let your gospel do a deep transforming work inside of them. And God, would that result in new people giving their life um, to Jesus? Would that uh, result in um, marriages being strengthened, uh, families and relationships being reconciled? Um, and God, would disciples be made in South Lincoln. Uh, God, we pray that your spirit would do a mighty work, the work that only you can do uh, in them and through them. Would you give Alex and Ricky um, strength and boldness and courage and perseverance and resiliency during this tough season to keep pressing forward and keep bringing the gospel uh, into the dark places of South Lincoln. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks guys for Thank coming you. out. In a second, we're going to hear from, uh, from Pastor Ricky as he preaches to us from Psalm 22. Uh, but for now, uh, could you guys stand together? Uh, we're going to invite our scripture reader up to read from Psalm 22 right now. The reading this morning comes from Psalm 22, verses 1 through 11. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you, I was cast from my birth and from my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me for trouble is near and there is none to help. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, Providence Church. My name is Ricky. Uh, yeah, I'm one of the pastors at City, City Light South in Lincoln. Um, you know, and I just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you for your generosity uh, to give to us to just help see more churches be planted, more disciples being made. Um, you know, that's not just a testimony of, of your generosity, but just also of your heart. Um, because of just a lot of that, um, it's so easy to look inward and, hey, what can we do to help benefit us? But you guys are like, hey, we want to look outward so that more people uh, can know Jesus. And so thank you so much uh, for your generosity and, and just helping us. Um, yeah, uh, there, you know, there are just a lot of things in this world that just don't really make a lot of sense. Uh, for me, one of those things is the show The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. Um, you know, people go on the show, and, you know, if you haven't watched it, they go on the show, and they're hoping to find love, you know, and they compete with these other people for the affection of one person. And, hey, you know, they go on a few dates, and, and these dates are just extravagant. You know, they're, they're selling on some yacht. Uh, they're going to Greece, flying in helicopters, all these things that are just 
just totally not realistic. And um, this just doesn't seem like a very smart idea to me if your goal is to find love with someone and marry them until death do us part. And if you're out there and you're like, man, I love this show, I'm watching it. Hey, that's fine. Uh, you know, that's great. But you still have to admit, even if you really like the show, you're still thinking, hey, I don't really actually think this makes a lot of sense to actually find love and, you know, be in this great marriage and build a healthy marriage. Um, and, and, you know, so it's kind of this question like, why? What, why do people do this? And, and we, we ask questions, that, that question of why, about a lot of things. Um, I mean, people that meet me and my wife, Christy, they're probably like, hey, so why did Christy, who's amazing and beautiful, why did she marry you? Um, we still don't know the answer to that, but, you know, um, maybe you've been asking this question of like, hey, why can't the Huskers finally get get good at football. Uh, just when, it, when is it going to happen? Um, you know, hey, why is this coronavirus thing? Why is that happening? Or hey, why during this pandemic, why is everybody so concerned with having enough toilet paper when the flu doesn't actually cause any change of the frequency of your bowel movements? But yes, so we're wondering like, but everybody's getting it. Why? You know, and we, we ask this question even at a deeper level when there are things that happen in, to, in our lives that are extremely difficult. God, why is this happening to me? God, I, why are you not doing anything? God, why don't you stop it? God, why aren't you listening to me in the midst of all of these things and this chaos and this trouble and this suffering that I'm facing? God, why? And, and the author here is experiencing the, the a very similar thing. So, uh, yeah, if you got a Bible, open it up to uh, Psalm 22. By the way, you know, if you haven't sat down, go ahead and sit, sit, sit down. Um, but verse 1, um, you know, this is David, and he's calling out, and he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, right off the gate, like, he, he's starting off hot, you know, and just, just coming out here, and he says, Hey, why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And I cry out by night, but I find no rest. And so, you know, we just see all of this, th these questions. He's facing this, this terrible situation. And he has these questions, God, why? Why have you forsaken me? God, why? I'm crying out to you. My groans are going out to you. And God, why haven't you heard? You, you're, you seem so distant, God. It feels like you've deserted me. It feels like you're so far away. And he just feels that, that God has left him, that God is, not, is ignoring him, that God is not even paying attention to him anymore. And then this isn't just even just some casual chat with God. I mean, he's crying out. I mean, verse two, um, you know, he just says, I, oh my God, I cry out by day. You know, it, it, it's, it's so hard. I cry out by night. This is all the time I'm crying out to you day and night, God, but I find no rest. I don't hear you, God. And it feels like you're just turning a blind eye to me. And, and as my prayers go up to you, God, it feels like they get no further than the ceiling. And, 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 you know, many of you can relate. Maybe it's now that you can relate or something in the past. You know, maybe you've, you've felt this similar way that God is just far away from you because somebody that, that you love, you found out that they have cancer. Maybe, maybe someone that you love has died. Maybe you were so hoping for this future date of joy, but you had a miscarriage. Maybe you're just feeling so distraught because you can't get pregnant. Maybe you are sick, and you, or maybe it's just something in your life that you've been struggling with for years, and you just feel like you can't kick it. Maybe it's some sort of sin struggle, or maybe it's some sort of condition. Maybe you're struggling with anxiety or depression. It's just like, God, why is this still here, God? I've called out to you. I'm asking you for these things and I keep begging you to do something and nothing happens, nothing changes. And you get frustrated because even the things that you're asking for, they're good things. I mean, wouldn't God want these things to happen? 
Doesn't God care about these things, but yet nothing changes and we just feel helpless and hopeless and completely in despair. And here David is just crying out these same things. My God, why have you forsaken me? And even in the next chapter of, of 23, you know, in verse four, he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. But here in 22, that doesn't feel true. Man, God, I am walking through the valley of the shadow of death, and God, you're nowhere to be found. That doesn't seem true anymore, and the only thing, you know, God seems incredibly distant. He's, he's nowhere to be seen, but the only thing that seems to actually be near to him are these people that, that are actually, you know, kind of enemies, and, and they're, they're mocking him. Look at verse six. You know, he says, but I am a worm, I'm not a, you know, and not a man. I'm scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me, all these people that are looking at me, they mock me. They make mouths at me. You know, they're, they're making fun of me. They wag their heads. And this is what they're saying. He trusts in the Lord. Let, let him deliver him. Let God deliver him. Let, let him rescue him for he delights in him. And then, you know, there's, there's these people, they're, they're all around him and they're mocking him later on. He says that they, these enemies encompass me. They encircle me. They're surrounding me. They, they despise him and they're mocking him because they're actually watching this, this guy cry out to God. They're asking, the, they're watching this guy trust God. And they're, they're saying, him, saying to him, man, that guy's trusting God and yet God is doing nothing. Gosh, what a fool. What a fool for, for trusting in God and they're mocking him for his belief. You know, as being part of the, the City Light family and with these, these uh, you know, just a network with these other pastors, we have this text thread with these other pastors. And some of these other pastors, you know, they're in Council Bluffs. And, and so they're Iowa Hawkeye fans. Um, yeah, I know. It's just like, man, does God really... Love them, but um, but they're these Iowa Hawkeye fans, and they'll 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 get on there every once in a while, and they'll kind of poke at us, you know, like oh hey, you know, because they beat us, and uh, you know they'll just mock us for for being Husker fans. And here's the bummer thing about it is it's like there's really nothing right now we can say. I mean, it's just like yeah, you won, and. We didn't, again. And, and so that's just super frustrating, um, you know, because we, we love our, our, our Huskers, we love our team, and it's just this bummer. And it's one thing for us to be mocked because of our sports team, but it's an entirely different thing to be mocked for your God, to be made fun of and to be just ridiculed because, man, look at him. He's trusting in God, and yet God is doing nothing. And David describes how just distressed he feels. He just keeps going on in, in, this, in this desperation. Um, verse 14, he just says, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. Um, all my enemies are all around me. Uh, he can't do anything. He can't, he can't defend himself because, you know, he, his, his, his body is just breaking down. My heart is like wax. You know, it's just like I'm melting away. He has no energy. He's just completely broken to do anything. He's dying of thirst. And, he, you know, in verse 17, he says, I can, um, verse 17, he says, I can count all my bones. My enemies are, are surrounding me. And then in verse 18, he says, they divide my garments among them. And, and for my clothing, they cast lots. Hey, they're, all these people, they're just around me. They know that I'm about to die. And they're just figuring out who gets my stuff. Man, this guy's saying, hey, I'm going to grab his watch. Another, hey, I got, I'm going to get his wallet. Somebody's like, hey, I got dibs on his iPhone. You know, they're just all there. I mean, this guy's about to kick the bucket. Nobody's lending a helping hand. Nobody's giving him kind of any type of encouragement. And, and David here is just saying, man, I'm done. I'm down for the count. I can't pick myself up from the mat. I'm about to die. And God, it seems like you, in, in the moment that I need you most, God, it seems like you're so far away and the only thing that is around me are these people and they're not here to help me. They're here to just watch me die. 
I just want us to see two truths in this section here. And the first one is this, is this that we can be weak. We can be weak when we go to God. I mean, again, he's struggling here. David's struggling here. I mean, when, in verse one and two, when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or, or and he says, um, you know, why are you so far from saving me? I cry out by day and you don't answer. I mean, we're not finding that verse on a coffee mug. I mean, that's just not what we're told. Those aren't the things that we just cling to, that we want to so memorize. My God, I'm crying out and you don't answer. But that's, not, that's not what we're told. We're told, hey, rejoice in the Lord always. Oh man, hey, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, give you hope and a future. Those are the ones that we find on our coffee mugs. But we can be, what this is showing is just that we can be weak, we could be messy, we can be hurt when we just go to God, our lives, our souls. They don't have to be kind of like how we operate in life. I and mean, when we go to Facebook and it's like, hey, let me show you the good stuff that's going in my life. We edit our Instagram photos to make sure that they all look great. Let's show people these happy and good times, but not the tough things. And, and the, the, what I just love about the Bible, and, and even here, these heavy words of, of Scripture and, and other places, that God doesn't edit a bunch of stuff out. I mean, he, he shows Abraham, Abraham lies. Even though that God, this is like God's guy, Abraham lies. Israel, God's people, they're unfaithful. The disciples who Jesus hand selects, they don't always get it. Then they abandon Jesus. I mean, like, I mean, just think about it. If this was us and we're the one that are telling these stories or the, we're the one that's making the movie of our life when we come to Psalm 22, we're editing that stuff out. Hey, cameras, cut. Cut. Stop the cameras rolling. Let's look at this. I want you to show the great things that are going on in my life. Don't show this, 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 pair, this prayer of distress. I want to show you this prayer where I'm just singing and praising God. No, we, want, we want that for, for, for God. We want that for people. Hey, here, here's me being strong, but I don't want you to see me being weak. Hey, why don't you, you keep the cameras rolling when you see me playing and, and having fun with my kids, but let's cut it when I'm screaming at them. Man, let's take pictures of me on a date night with my spouse, but not show us in our weakness when we're yelling at each other and disagreeing. Let's, let's show, me the, show me when I'm being content and being single. But I really don't want anybody to see that actually I'm just really struggling because I want that kind of relationship. We want everybody to see us that we got the new job, not that we didn't even get any interviews for several jobs that we've applied for. Show me when I'm praising God and I'm reading my Bible, not when I'm struggling and I'm in sin. Let's edit out my apathy for God. But here, what we see here in this passage, and we just really see throughout the Psalms a lot and throughout Scripture, is that God is saying, hey, don't come to me with your filtered life. Don't come to me with your edited version that you think somehow makes yourself look better, look stronger to me. I'm not asking you to do that. I know that you are weak. And so come to me with all of it, with all of your mess, bring it to me. So we see that truth that we get to be weak, but we also see this truth that God understands us, that he can relate. I mean, just notice here in, in this, this, uh, this passage is that it, it, there's just kind of like this, this rhythmic um, rhythm to the, the, to the passage. So it's, hey, I'm in despair. I'm going to look to you. I'm in despair. I'm going to look to you. And the author is showing us, hey, man, that life is like that. There's these moments where you feel, man, I'm really trusting God. I'm excited about who God is and what he's doing. I totally have faith. And then there's these moments of just utter despair, hey, man, there's a better week and I'm getting in the word, but man, there's this week where I just don't care. And you just see this ups and downs and, and I just love that, that, that God is like, hey, I get it. That's life. That's real life. That's how these things go. It has these ups and downs, but, but more than that, it is, it's not just that we see that, but we see that, hey, actually God understands, not just because God knows everything, but actually because God has experienced this. I mean, even um, when we start off this, this, in this passage where it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We know that that's what Jesus said. Jesus knows what that's like. Jesus knows what it's like to be mocked by those around him. 
those that are, that are, that are circling around him to, to get him. I mean, in Matthew 27, it says they, they, they mock him as king of the Jews. You know, they said to him, hey, Jesus, you, you've saved others. Why don't you save yourself? Why don't you get yourself down from that cross? He trusted in God. Why don't you, why, why doesn't God deliver him now? I mean, even the, the robbers that were next to him and also being crucified, they, they, they join in and they mock him too. Jesus had his enemies cast lots for his clothes, just waiting again for him to die. Jesus was thirsty. I mean, even David, as he prays three times in this Psalms of just going to God, God, please, please come. God, please, but not be far off. Please answer me. He comes to him three times, Jesus, when he's in the garden of Gethsemane and just going to God and he's just sweating drops of blood because of just the, the, the pressure that is on him. He just goes to God and says, God, man, if there's another way, please take this cup from me. Just because he's in such anguish. And so God gets it because he's experienced it. This is what Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says. It says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with us, empathize with our weaknesses. But we have a high priest. We have one that who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then, because, you know, because we, we, God empathizes with our weakness, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We do not suffer alone. Whatever it is that you're going through right now, know that, that you can go to God, that you can be weak, that you can be hurt, that you can be distraught, that you can be just on your last leg and just not knowing what to do. But also know that as you go to God in your weakness, in just your pain, that God actually understands you. That God gets it. He's not just some far off, distant God that is just saying like, hey, get your act together. But he's like, hey, I understand. Please come to me with all of that. And so we, we see just David's despair here. But we also see um, th this dependence from David and him just running to God. Um, in verse 3, you know, he says, yet, God, you know, hey, God, you don't, I, I cry out to you, I find no rest, verse three. Yet you are holy. You're holy, God. You're enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you, our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried and were rescued. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. You know, I mean, like, hey, it seems like God isn't talking at all, but David keeps talking to God. And he appeals to God's character. God, you're holy. You're set apart. You're different. God, David looks to the past. God, you were faithful to Israel. All of these things that you've done in the past, even though Israel was not faithful to you, you were faithful to Israel and you have delivered them. You have heard them in their cries. And then David keeps going there in verse 9. After he talks about how the people are mocking him, verse 9, he says, Yet you, God, you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. Oh, you was I cast from birth. And from my mother's womb, you have been my God. God, you've been, not only have you been with Israel and the people, or our fathers long ago, but God, you've been with me from the very beginning. God, you've been with me every step of the way. So he's just looking to, to God's faithfulness and how he's been faithful. And then even he continues just, you know, trying to, to have this kind of fight for faith and going to God in verse, uh, verse 19. And he says, but you, O Lord, do not be far, for, far off. O you, help. Come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, from my precious life, from the power of the dog. Save me from the, from the mouth of the lion. Rescue me from the horns of wild oxen. You have rescued me. And so just, just one thing to notice is, is that, you know, in the pr uh, earlier verses, he, he lists the enemies that he has. And he lists them as, hey, the, these, the, my enemies are like the bulls of Bashan. They're, they're, they're like lions. They're like dogs. And then when he goes to God and he prays and he says, hey, rescue me from the dogs, from the lions and from these oxen. It's like this reverse order. And he's just going to God saying, hey, God, I want you to not just stop it, but I want you to undo it. 
undo all these things that my enemies are, are doing to me. Just undo it. Just like, hey, you, you went to Abraham and he had nobody. He had no seed, no kids. And yet, God, you, you actually reversed it and made him the father of many nations. Hey, my people, that your people, God, they were slaves in Egypt. But through the Exodus, through Moses, you actually made these slaves into a, a great people and gave them a land, gave them a hope. And so, God, I'm asking you to undo these things in my life. And, and he just keeps going back from the kind of this despair to this, this, this dependence. And he's appealing not to just God and what God has done, but he's also just appealing to God's character. God, you are holy, enthroned in Israel. I mean, think, think of people. You know, so one day somebody can... Uh, act one, uh, you know, act one way, uh, you know, one day, but then the next they act completely different. They could say something one day, but then the next day they, they don't recall it. Somebody can shoot you straight one day and then lie to your face the next. Somebody could say, hey, I do till death do us part one year, and then the next year they don't want to be around you anymore and you're getting a divorce. And so somebody could have good business sense one day and be making great decisions and the next not so much. But God isn't like that. This is what Numbers 23, 19 says. It says, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. He, he, does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? James 1, 17, God doesn't change. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so even, even in these circumstances that you're facing that are, that are hard, they're difficult, they're real, but those circumstances can change. But Jesus, God, he doesn't change. He's completely reliable, the same, same forever. God's love for you doesn't fluctuate because you have a good day or a bad day. God doesn't forget about you. God always keeps his promises. And so we can be confident in him. Knowing that, man, just not has he done things, but that's who God is. You're a holy God. I could totally trust in you. I can come to you with everything because I know that you are God. You will do what you say you will do. And, and you know, many times when we're facing these tough circumstances, what we tend to do is we tend to look at God and we inter t uh, tend to interpret God through our circumstances. But what we need to do is always be like, hey, my first thing that I'm always looking at is God. God is the one that won't change. And so when my circumstances change, when they get tough, I'm going to look and interpret those circumstances through who God is. I'm going to see through, through him. And so he just keeps going to God. And even if it doesn't seem like God is speaking to you in a really hard time, and, and yes, hey, that might feel like a problem, but it's a bigger problem if you stop speaking to God. Right? Don't run from God in your suffering. Continue over and over again. Run to him. I mean, David doesn't just say, hey, one time, hey, God, listen to me, and then leave it at that. He keeps going to God over and over again. And in verse 21, it kind of has this shift here. In verse 21, it says, you have rescued me. You have answered. You have heard. And, and here's the weird thing in there is, um, and the, you know, the, it might be a little frustrating, but in here, David actually doesn't say, hey, you've heard me because my circumstances are different. Hey, God, you, you've, you've rescued me because it's going to happen, you know, like it's happened. He doesn't say that, he just says, you have heard me. And again, we don't see any change of circumstance, but he has this assurance. God, you have been faithful to Israel, to the people back in the time. You've been faithful with me from the beginning. And God, because you've always been faithful, I just know that you're going to answer me. You're going to be faithful in the future. And so then he goes on to say, hey, because God has, has heard because of God's goodness, I'm going to proclaim about God, and I'm going to proclaim about what you've done. And so we see in, in these, um, this last section, this just proclamation from David and this expectation of what God is going to do because people are going to hear of God's goodness. People are going to hear of God's faithfulness, and they're going to be impacted. And so David, he can't keep this to himself. I mean, just look here. 
Verse 22, I'm going to tell your name to my brothers. In the midst of congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. Stand in awe of him, all offspring of, of Israel. He doesn't despise or abhor the afflict, affliction of the afflicted. He's not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when he cried to him. And so he, he just says, hey, man, all of this is going to happen. God has done amazing things. He's good, and, and he's, he's just expecting, man, I'm going to proclaim of your goodness, and people are going to join in. The congregation is going to join in. The needy, the afflicted, they're all joining in. And he even goes on, in verse 27, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship. And God's purpose for, for Israel was that she would be you know, a kingdom of priests that she would be because of this relationship that, that Israel would have with God, that this would be this light to the world and that they would help bring in other people, the Gentiles, to know God. And, and David saw God's deliverance of him. He's like, man, hey, God did that for me and I, I think that this is gonna carry out through the ends of the earth to, to those that are needy, to those that are rich or dying even later generations in the future, those that are even unborn, they're going to hear of who God is and they're going to worship God. It's not just something that he can enjoy, this grace and this answer of God to himself, but it's something that he has to share. And, and the same is true for us. We're not merely meant to enjoy God's grace, but to extend his glory. And just as David has this earnest expectation that, hey, because I'm going to share of what God has done, God is going to do these amazing things. Think of how God can use you in your life. Just because you're proclaiming, you're sharing what God has done in your life. I mean, here, you don't know how God can use you to impact somebody's life for eternity. Not just maybe you're a coworker, but even their kids. Even those down the roads, even those that are on board, you just don't know how God can use you to share of God's goodness, the gospel message of what God has done in your life, that you could share that with others and that God is going to use that. I mean, this doesn't just apply to us individually, but, but Providence Church, this applies to you as a church family. God can use you in amazing ways as you declare God's goodness to those around you. I mean, there's a lot of just junk and evil in this world. I mean, but, but, but what if, what if God used providence in these amazing ways to declare who he is to this lost and broken world? I mean, what, what if Providence Church was so excited about what God was doing and the, as they're sharing to those around them of, hey, man, God has done this in my life. What if that shuts this encouragement to all those other people that don't know Christ and they're thinking, man, if God worked in their life like that, man, maybe he can work in mine like that too. I mean, what, what, if, what if those that are lonely and feeling that God is distant from them, that he's forsaken them, what if through you that, that they hear a different story? And they see you loving them and they begin to believe that God really hasn't forgotten them. And he's using this church to show them that. I mean, what if those that are afflicted, those that are oppressed, those that, that are needy, they hear just for how God cares for all people. I mean, there's been a lot of things in this, these past weeks that have just been, they've just been awful. I mean, even this, this past week, Maybe you've seen it, this, this, you know, and there, there's this, this thing going on in Minneapolis where this, this man was arrested and he had another man press his, his knee on his neck for several minutes that eventually just killed him. And he died. George Floyd. Something is wrong. We know it. There's something wrong all around us. And these stories will keep popping up again and again. And yes, they're wrong, but they're not wrong just because our society says they're wrong or people on Facebook says they're wrong. They're wrong because God says so. God says, man, I've made all people, everyone in my image. They're worthy of dignity and honor and respect and love because that is my creation. 
And what if, what if you, Providence Church, as God's people say, hey, because we worship God and God is so amazing, he's so good, and he's created everything, we will treat his creation in a loving way with dignity and honor and respect because we love our God and he loves his creation, he loves all, everybody. Man, what a light that could be to the world. It says, hey, God is making actually a different people here that love and value each other even with their differences. They celebrate those differences. The world could be changed because, because of the message, this proclamation that is going out through you, church. Have that expectation. David is expecting that God will do amazing things through this proclamation that he will, he will share and so we've seen David's desperation, this pain, this anguish that he's experiencing. We've seen this, this dependence that he keeps coming to God. And we've seen this proclamation of this message that we'll share. But ultimately, this, pa- this passage here in Psalm 22 isn't ultimately about David. There's no event in David's life that can actually account for everything that's happened here in this psalm. Sure, David had enemies. They surrounded him at times, and sure, David had, you know, moments of, of despair and anguish, but, but there are certain things that David never had, but he's never had his hands pierced, his feet pierced. Because in, in Acts 2, it says that David was a prophet and that he foresaw what was to come in Jesus. And so David, you know, just guided by the Holy Spirit is seeing, hey, Actually, crucifixion at the time of David didn't exist. It's not even a Jewish thing. It's a Roman invention that came centuries later. God has got him and saying, hey, I'm not pointing to you, David. I'm pointing to the one that is to come. I'm pointing to Jesus Christ. Because David here is describing things poetically. But Jesus experienced them literally. Jesus was mocked by all of those around him, and they yelled at him to, tr- to, to save himself. He was surrounded by his enemies. When they crucified Jesus, they cast lots for his clothes. This is what it says in Isaiah 53, 3. It says, he, Jesus, was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. And in this passage, we see no vengeance declared on their enemies. Jesus, even from the cross, says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Verse 15, his tongue sticks to the roof of his mouth, and Jesus says from the cross, I thirst Verse 17, I can't count all my bones. Verse 2, or verse um, 4, I am a worm and I'm not a man. And what it says of the suffering servant of Jesus, Messiah to come, in Isaiah 52, it says that he was marred beyond human likeness, not even recognizable as a man. And his heart is like wax. It's just Jesus cries out to the Father as he's sweating drops of blood, and he asks God if it's possible If there's another way, take this cup from me. And in a moment of utter despair, as there was just darkness covering the land, Jesus cries out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that is the question that David starts with in verse 1. And then in verse 21, we hear this answer from from God. And God will give this ultimate answer in Jesus Christ. So as, as, as David says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or as we cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God answers and he says, I didn't. I sent my son to be forsaken for you so that you would never be forsaken. He was rejected. He was abandoned for you so that you could come near to me so that you would be accepted to me. As Andrew read earlier from 2 Corinthians 5.21, you know, it says that he who knew no sin, Jesus who knew no sin, became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of Christ in him, righteousness of God in him. Galatians 3.13, it says that he became a curse for us. Jesus didn't just die for sin and pay the price that we rightfully deserved. He became sin for us. He was forsaken so that you and I never would have to be. I love what Timothy Keller, he's a pastor in New York, says, he says, the sovereign God himself has come down into this world and has experienced its darkness. He has personally drunk the cup of its suffering down to its dregs. And he did it to not justify himself, but to justify us. That is, to bear the suffering, death, and the curse for sin that we've earned Jesus takes the punishment upon himself so that someday he can return and end all evil without having to condemn and punish us. 
Isaiah 53 says, Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, our sin, and he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. God laid all of those sins on Jesus. And then Jesus went to the cross and was crucified, and he paid the price for your sin, for your greed, for your pride, for all of those things, for your selfishness. You are guilty, but yet the innocent one in Jesus who did no wrong, knew no sin, became your sin, became our sin so that we might know God, so that we might be made right with God. And I love just how this this psalm ends. It starts with a cry of pain, but it ends with a cry of victory, and it just says all at the end of it that he has done it. Very reminiscent of of Jesus' words from the cross where he just says, it is finished. He has done it, which means you can't do it. You can't make yourself right with God. You can't earn it. You can't make it happen. Remember a couple years ago, Uh, we broke out my old Nintendo 64 and we had, uh, one of the greatest games ever known was Super Mario Kart. And we broke this thing out and we're playing it and I'm playing it with my kids and my, my son Colton, who's about five years old at the time, he's racing. I mean, he, he, he just can't get it. He, he, he's terrible. And it's just not happening. He can't even finish the race. And this just goes on and he just can't figure it out. And, and one, you know, he just says, dad, will you race for me? And he puts the remote control in my hand and I race and I'm not going to lie, but I'm awesome at it. And uh, so, I mean, I'm racing and I, I mean, I get first prize and I'm like, Hey, do you want to try it? And he goes, no, just keep racing for me. And so I race again, get first place, race again, get first place, race all the way through the whole cup. And then I get first pl- prize for the whole cup, and then I get the remote, and I put it in his hand, and there, he's getting the trophy. It's coming down on the screen, and then he says, I won. He didn't do anything. All he did was provide the need for someone else to do it for him. And that's what it is For God, you provided nothing in the situation. You can't save yourself from sin. You can't make yourself more acceptable to God. You can't earn it. You can't clean yourself up. You can't make yourself, you know, just less sinful or less in need. Jesus has done it. He was the one that was forsaken for us so that we would never be. He was the one that just said, it is finished because he paid the price for our sin in full. He's the one that earned our victory. He's the one that has earned us to be made right with God so that we might be saved from our sin and saved to God, not because of what we've done, but because we're trusting in what Jesus Christ has done for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you so much for these words, Lord, that we know that we can be weak, that we could come to you with everything in our pain, in our suffering, Lord, thank you that you've paid the ultimate, you've you've paid the ultimate suffering for us. Lord, you you were forsaken so that we would never be. Lord, and that you took your sin on yourself. You were punished for us in our place so that we might be made right with God, that we might be adopted as your sons and your daughters and be brought near by the blood of Christ. And Lord, thank you. Lord, that you just say it is finished. God has done it for us. By your love, by your grace, we are saved, God. And so we thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church family, at this time, we're going to eat the communion meal together. Um, And as we do, I wanted um, to to call us to communion from this passage um, from Psalm 22, as we've just read. Um, In verse 26, it says, The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. Um, And today, as we take the communion meal, um, the the cup that Jesus drank was death. But now that the cup uh, we get to drink um, is the cup of life in Christ.
And so as we um, take the communion cup, um, Jesus drank death for us so that we could drink his life, right? This, symbolically, this is what the communion cup represents. So would you take that with us now? And likewise, as we eat um, the symbolic body of Christ, we realize that Christ was broken um, on the cross. He was the one who was afflicted, the one who was forsaken, the one who was beaten. Um, and so uh, as we eat this meal, we remember not that, um, that we're broken, but that Christ was broken for us. And so now we eat his broken body um, to be made whole. Symbolically, that's what this represents, is wholeness in Christ.
I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Until I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you You call my name from whom all blessings flow praise him all creatures here below praise him above the heavenly host praise Father the Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. 
Amen, church family. As, um, as we conclude uh, this week in Psalm 22, I wanted to leave us with these words from 1 Corinthians. It says this, um, 1 Corinthians verse uh, 30 through 31. It says this, And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. Because of God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. So that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. God was forsaken for you so that you could become one with Christ. So you could be in Christ, have his righteousness, his sanctification, and his redemption. This week, Providence, God is not far from us. He's actually closer than our skin. Um, and so uh, as we go through this week, um, as we go through the ups and downs of life, would we remember that God has not forsaken us. He's forsaken Christ so that we would never be forsaken. Would we live our lives um, in communion and unity with Christ and his church this week? See you next week. Thank you, Ricky, for giving us a word over Psalm 22 this morning. And thank you, our Providence family, for joining us every Sunday morning online. If God is leading you to respond this morning, we would love for you to reach out. You can email us at info at providenceomaha.org and a staff team member will pray with you. If you are with your family members this morning or you're with your city group, we have some discussion questions for you. Those will be typed out in the description below or on the screen in the next couple of moments for you to take a picture and discuss those in your groups. Take the next couple of moments to take a picture of the screen or get those discussion questions ready. Thank you for joining us this morning. We will keep you up to date with news about gatherings and city groups moving forward. For now, plan on joining us again next Sunday at 10 a.m. But remember, come early at 945 to chat and catch up with those that you can't be physically present with. Up next is our kids gathering. Parents, we would love for you to spend time celebrating this moment that you get to worship with your children. Our kids gathering will start in a couple of moments, so get ready and we will worship with you soon. Hello, Providence kids and families. Welcome back to our weekly kids gathering. My name is Andrea, and I'm so excited that you're worshiping with us this morning. 
Are you ready to say good morning to God? Put your hands up in the air and on the count of three, let's say, what's up God? Are you ready? One, two, three. What's, what's up, up God? God? Now, let's give an air high five to each other through the screen. Ready? One, two, three. Now, give your mom or dad an air high five. Ready, go! Today, we don't need any props for our big God story. So let's stand up and worship together. But the best news that I've ever heard in my life was God's wonderful message about how Jesus came to die for our sins. This news was spread all over the world after the book of Acts in the big God story. Many people became Christians and began to follow the ways of Jesus. With the power of the Holy Spirit renewing and changing them, they were able to begin to live for Him. Let's take a minute to thank God for giving us the gift of Jesus and sending his Holy Spirit to live in us. Would you pray with me? Let's fold our hands, close our eyes, and bow our heads. Dear Lord, you love the world and you gave your son, Jesus, to save us. Thank you for sending him to be our rescuer and giving us the Holy Spirit to live inside of us. As we listen to the story today, Holy Spirit, would you be with us and quiet our hearts and minds so that you can teach us. We pray this in your name, amen. All right, now it's time for the big God story. Here we go. Do you remember last week when we talked about Paul? Paul was a man who became a believer in Jesus and it changed his whole life. Paul traveled all around telling people about Jesus. He started churches in the areas that he visited and then he would leave them so they could run on their own. But Paul would often check in with the new churches to see how they were doing. If they had started believing things that weren't true, Paul would write letters to help the churches remember God's truth and that God's Spirit renews or changes us. Did you know that we can read some of these letters today? Do you know where? Yeah, in the Bible, the New Testament. Many of Paul's letters became part of the Bible. Well. The churches in Galatia had started believing things that weren't true. Aww. They forgot about the freedom that God offers and that His Spirit makes us new. 
So Paul wrote a letter to the Christians in Galatia to remind them about how to follow God. Paul found out that some Jewish leaders were telling the Galatians that they still needed to follow the Jewish law to be part of the family of God. Dear Galatians, let's read Galatians 5, 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Before Jesus came, the way that the Galatians showed other people that they loved God was by offering sacrifices, eating certain foods, and dressing in a certain way. And then Jesus came and he changed everything. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to live in the hearts of those who trust him. The Holy Spirit changes our hearts from the inside and helps us want to obey God. We're free from sin and the law and we're free to obey God. You are free. Paul reminded the Christians that they'd been running a good race. That means that they were following Jesus without stopping. But then the false teachers came in and they started to believe the things that weren't true. Aww. Paul also reminded the Christians that even though they were free, they shouldn't just do whatever they wanted all the time. They should use the freedom that God gives us to love one another. Now let's read Galatians 5, 13 and 14. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love each other. When is it easy to love each other? It's easy when other kids are kind to you or always invite you to play with them. But when is it hard to love others? It's hard for me to love people when they're mean to me. Aww. It isn't always easy to love those around us. But when we become Christians, God sends his Holy Spirit to live in us. His Spirit comes and renews us or makes us new. Through the power of his Holy Spirit, we can love those around us. When we live by God's Spirit, He also produces good fruit in us. The fruit He brings into our lives isn't the fruit that we eat. The fruit of God's Spirit is what happens in our lives when we follow Him. Let's read Galatians 5, and 23. You may have heard this verse before. Some of you may have even memorized it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Okay, let's say those again slowly. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. God's Spirit renews us and brings these things into our lives. When we show patience, when we love each other, and when we're kind to each other, these are all the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Paul then reminded the Christians in Galatia that they could help one another. If one of them sinned, they could point out the sin and help that person do what was right. Paul reminded them that they could do all these things because God's Spirit renews. God's Spirit renews. Now let's read Galatians 6, 9, and 10. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Paul encouraged everyone to do good to one another because that's what pleases God. Do good. Paul finished his letter by reminding the Galatians that they didn't need to follow the law of Moses to show that they were members of God's family. God had given them the free gift of salvation and made them new through his spirit. Paul signed the letter with his own writing and a blessing from God, and it's found in Galatians 6, 18. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. 
Amen. Paul had to write to the Galatians because they had listened to false teachers and forgotten that God had set them free. They needed to be reminded that God's Spirit had renewed them and changed them. God does the same for us today. When we become Christians, God changes our hearts and sends us His Spirit to help us live for Him. We can always turn to God and ask Him to renew us and help us love one another. Thank you so much for joining me today for the Big God Story. Up next, there will be a few questions that you can discuss with your parents. And this week, each time you eat a piece of fruit, remember the fruit of the Spirit. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us this morning. Remember to join us again next Sunday on YouTube at 10 a.m. Have a wonderful week.